Of all the organizations in history, you'd have to say that the Catholic Church is the most important. Having existed for nearly 2,000 years and having 1.3 billion followers, well, remaining while empires have risen and fallen, it is a truly remarkable organization. The Catholic Church's relationship with the governments of the West has been complicated. The Catholic Church is mostly a cultural power, only really controlling a central belt in Italy, while having to use cultural influence over the rest of Europe. There are parts of history where the Catholic Church was the most powerful force in Europe, but to ever call it the dominant one would have been foolish. However, there was a point in the late 13th and early 14th centuries when the papacy's power looked supreme and appeared to have been growing exponentially. The papal bureaucracy spread across much of Europe, with tendrils deepening everywhere. However, these efforts were eventually thwarted and national governments became the most important force in the West. However, what would have happened if this never occurred? What if the Catholic Church was able to take over Western European civilization, leaving the national monarchies like France, Spain, Germany, or England in a subordinate position? What would borders, culture, demographics, and war be like in this timeline? That is the question of this alternate history. The papacy's high point of power came with the defeat of the Holy Roman Empire. From the 11th to mid-13th centuries, these two organizations fought each other to the bloody end for control with Italy. This ended the Holy Roman Empire collapsing as a united entity, leaving Germany and North Italy a mosaic of tiny, squabbling states. The papacy also crushed the Waldensian and Albigensian heretics. Inquisitors wandered Italy, Spain, and the southern parts of Germany and France, killing heretics. Papal bureaucracy spread across Europe, greatly aided by the invention of the Franciscans and friars, who were able to avoid the corruption of the earlier orders and create a moral revolution inside the church. The origin of a lot of conflict with secular authorities was over the appointment of bishops, which the kings of Europe and the papacy fought over bitterly. This may not seem important today, but remember that the church is a huge landholder, and so the modern equivalent would be if the U.S. was fighting over if a foreign government could choose the government for a solid 15 of the 50 states in America, the church claimed to own all the land in Western Europe and merely be lending it to the monarchs, something which Europe's royalty did in no way agree with. However, the papacy's power play got completely trolled by France, the second most powerful country in Europe after the Holy Roman Empire. The papacy tried to make the king of France agree that he was a vassal to the pope and thus subject to his authority. The King of France responded by killing the Pope, creating his own Pope, moving the papacy from Rome to Avignon in modern-day France and back then right across the river from the Kingdom of France. In fact, the famous bridge at Avignon was created so that the Pope could stay in better touch with the King of France. The French King then staffed the Cardinals, or the guys who elect future Popes, as 60% Frenchmen. In total, Putin would be very proud. Fun fact, when I visited Avignon, the French audio guide described this whole Machiavellian maneuver as a progressive move on the Pope's part to prevent himself from becoming itinerant and moving about in his domain too much. Again, Putin would be very proud. So how could we make sure that the papacy would have beaten France? The big issue run into is the papal states had a population of 2 million without a great military, while the King of France ruled 16 million people and could raise an army of 100,000 at will. In a world where power comes from the muzzle of a gun, I mean blade of a sword, the papal states was at a huge disadvantage. The main advantage the papacy could pull on was Europe's highly decentralized political system, where the towns, nobility, monarchy, and local churches all competed for power. The papacy, if it played its cards well, could split local factions and side kingdoms to destroy the central monarchies. What happened at the Holy Roman Empire, which is just geographically huge, was that the pope was able to promise the German nobility and Italian city-states freedom if they rebelled against the emperor, which is what happened. In this timeline, France never has the nerve to just abduct the Pope and kill him, and instead they try to create their own anti-Pope, but never attack Rome and try a more diplomatic route. Pope Boniface, a very crafty man, is able to create an anti-French alliance involving the English, Burgundians, and powerful French noble families. This conflict drags on for 20 or so years, as the French monarchy gets weaker and weaker until the Capetian house finally loses power. The French invade Italy to fight the papacy, and also try to conquer the fabulously wealthy 
North Italian cities to fund their losing war against the papacy. This merely alienates these city-states who become staunch papal allies. We would likely see France collapse into feudal territories like the Holy Roman Empire, or frankly like France 200 years before. The English and Burgundians would be the big winners, with the English seizing much of Aquitaine as well as Normandy. Burgundy would gain full independence and become a Switzerland-like nation. With both France and the Holy Roman Empire destroyed, the two most powerful nations in Europe, the rest of Christian Europe would be very careful about offending the church and would give it all it wanted. The papacy really didn't care about local wars much, and the politics of the local monarchies, and thus the kings would remain independent. However, in culture, church affairs, and intellectual life, basically everything except the military and politics, the western kings would let the church be predominant. The Iberian kingdoms were already at this stage in the 14th century in our timeline, and the church was powerful in Italy, so much so that heresy was tolerated on a small level, since everyone knew the church was so powerful that nothing could harm it. This is actually quite familiar in history, and two examples from Asia can be quite enlightening. The first is India, in which the warrior Kshatriya caste was originally the most important, but over time, the Brahmin priest caste was able to gain control over basically every aspect of the society except the political by the 4th century AD. This was likely the most important event in Indian civilization's history. The second is China, where the educated Confucian bureaucrat class that managed the society from the 8th century onward would have behaved quite similarly to the monastic bureaucrat class that would manage Christendom. We're going to reference these two societies quite a bit as we move forward with this video. In India, the political was basically viewed as unimportant under clerical rule. This is why there were no histories in India before the arrival of the Muslims, around 1000 AD, since the Brahmin priest class viewed recording mere political events as unimportant to the great moral questions of the universe. The Kshatriya warrior nobilities still fought each other, but their political states were weak and unstable since politics was not the first priority of most of their people. The caste system was a huge factor here, but in Europe we would see local politics become secondary to Grand's papal authority. States would be weaker and church lands would refuse to give revenue and knights for war, and the papacy would create regulations on waging war and political action. Our timeline's Western civilization was so successful and exceptional in that it was the only major civilization that didn't become controlled by a single social class or political organization. In medieval Europe, the monarchy, nobility, church, and towns were all in conflict for power and thus had to compete. Similarly, on a national level, Europe never unified, thus producing endless military conflict that forced technological and social improvement. This has continued for all of Western history, as the West has never become complacent with a single ruling class. The West is by far the exception in world history in this, and this is the reason for why the West was so unbelievably successful. Similarly, the West is exceptional in that its primary ideology has been based off evidence, rather than believing in ideology over truth. Seriously, every other main civilization has created ideologies based around believing in some abstract form, rather than believing what you see in the physical world. This is so that the elite can claim whatever they want to be true, and in societies without a lot of internal competition they can get away with it. As you can guess, this has radical effects on technology. The most interesting example of this is the comparison between Christianity and Islam. Islam was originally more technologically advanced, but around 1200, Islam made the decision that God was inherently irrational, and the study of the outside world was unimportant since God could change it at will, while the study of the Quran was paramount. Meanwhile, in the West, they came to the conclusion that God was inherently rational, and the study of the world was the best way to understand God's plans since God made the world. In our timeline, the big anti-rational philosopher in Islam was Al-Ghazali, around the year 1100. Meanwhile, the West's big rational thinker, Thomas Aquinas, was around 1250. However, the argument went on for longer, with Avicenna making similar positions to Thomas Aquinas in the Islamic world, and Duns Scotus making similar arguments to Al-Ghazali in the Christian world around 1300. However, in a world where the Catholic Church would have no competition inside the Christian world, they would find Islamic-style thinking in which religious documents, which the Church had a monopoly on before the printing press, as very attractive, and the West would take on a similar philosophic attitudes to Islam, saying God was inherently irrational and only the study of religion was valuable. I hope you've realized that I'm basically saying the West would never rise to world power. Without serious political or social competition, the West would stop innovating. 
This is actually a more reasonable trajectory of events to what happens in our world, in which both Islam and China stop technologically innovating around 1200. I'm not hitting on the Catholic Church here and saying it's some horrifying regressive organization. As ideological bureaucratic organizations go, the Catholic Church has done very well. The Church is much to be proud of, whether keeping literacy alive in Western Europe after the fall of Rome, ending slavery in Europe or the gladiatorial games, trying to protect the American Indians during the Spanish and Portuguese colonizations of the New World, or basically being the only religious organizations that would stand up to the Nazis and communists. However, any organization without competition becomes corrupt and destructive to its society. The way non-competitive and bureaucratic organizations work is that they restrict innovation. High-level bureaucrats tend to be very smart people, but lacking in imagination. They are terrified of expansion, since it's often done by people with non-bureaucratic minds and since that would weaken their complete control. This is opposed to competitive systems, where expansion is welcomed as an opportunity to improve your own lot against your opponent. This has happened many times in history, but is most evident in China, where the Chinese bureaucracy destroyed China's industrial and technological revolution around 1100 by overregulation, since they didn't trust the merchants and thought they were fleecing the farmers, a protected class in Confucian philosophy. Similarly, they shut down China's colonial empire around 1420, since they believed expansion outside of China would weaken attempts to improve China, and the world outside of China was useless. Similarly, China had such a terrible record against barbarians like the Kittens, Jurchen, Mongols, and Manchu, who outnumbered them by ridiculous factors, since the bureaucrats purposely starved the military of money and talents, believing that iron is like men. You don't use your best for the army. We could assume Catholic Europe would behave in a similar manner. The Europeans would still likely discover America, I'd say. The move of harrowing populations from off Europe to Newfoundland around 1450 would mean that the English and Basque fishermen would have discovered America. Actually, it seems likely they both knew about Newfoundland before Columbus. However, evidence points to the Chinese and Muslims knowing about Australia for centuries before the Europeans without colonizing it. It seems very likely the Muslims circumnavigated Africa before the Europeans, but with closed social systems, none of these societies chose to exploit the discoveries. To maintain their control of scripture, which was the foundation of knowledge, Islamic societies banned the printing press. The West, traveling down a similar philosophic trajectory, would likely do a similar thing. Without the printing press, the Protestant Reformation, which is about reading the Bible, would never have happened. Papal control of Western civilization wouldn't have all been bad. The Catholic Church had nothing against urbanization and trade, and so, like China and Japan, after the Black Death, the West would have seen a market revolution as peasants would leave serfdom for cities and a capitalist economy. However, like China, bureaucracy would likely heavily throttle this. Similarly, the Catholic Church had great respect for learning and logic abilities. Among the tiny literate elite, these would thrive in a narrow range prescribed by the Church. I'm not going to go into all the effects of no age of exploration on regions like the Americas, Sub-Saharan Africa, East Asia, and Australia. That would be a video in of itself. However, Islam would be significantly more powerful. Without the advantages conferred in Europe by scientific warfare, without the massed gunfire of European naval artillery, the Ottoman Empire would have gained greater control of the Mediterranean and likely would have conquered southern Italy, before a crusade of all of Christendom would have saved Rome. Similarly, without scientific warfare's destruction of the nomadic horse tribes, you would see several more Genghis Khans and other nomadic horse tribes descend on and destroy large swaths of civilization. Poland, on the fringes of Western civilization, might have a greater degree of autonomy from the papacy and would be able to conquer Eastern Europe and become a powerful European player. Of any of the nations that would start a heresy, England, as an island tucked into the northwest corner of Europe, seems most likely. It would not surprise me if England would develop a heresy and go its own way, perhaps in a manner similar to Japan and China's relationship. In general, the world would be 300 or more years technologically behind what it was in our timeline. None of the main civilizations would be producing much technologically or trying anything new, having mostly gone into stagnation around 1200, waiting for a new batch of barbarians to force them to restart the civilizational cycle. It's kind of a boring ending. I mean, we're in quarantine, and so if you have time, I can rant up Mithraism or medieval cooking. Actually, why would I do that if I could tell you the great alternate history card game I've found? Forks in the Timeline is a party game that's basically about opening doors into different scenarios in the multiverse, with each card being a different alternate history question, like, what if the Roman Empire survived until the present? Or, what if Norse mythology was the one and only true religion? Or, what if the Mongols conquered Europe? Actually, this timeline started as a question inside this game. 
For the non-history fans here, who theoretically could exist, there are questions like, what if the Earth's atmosphere is 5% cocaine? Or, what if everyone tried to be Kim Kardashian? And then you get questions like, how would people salute each other in that situation, or what would be considered an indecent sex position? The person who makes the best argument, whether crazy, funny, accurate, or whimsical, gets the point. There are a hundred of each kind of question, and that makes an incredible number of combinations. I've played this game, and I can personally say it's a huge amount of fun. It's crazy, and each game is new and amusing. My friends weren't so wild with my 60-minute explanations for history questions with my bad mic, of course, but we all had a good time. As a pre-launch celebration, Forks in the Timeline is organizing an online contest where you can win a free game pack. I highly recommend you check out the link in the description to join the contest or alternatively pre-order and get a discount. Remember, the moral of this story, if it has any, is that free thinking and arguing could save your civilization. So that's all, folks. If you enjoyed that video, please comment, like, subscribe, stay tuned for future content, and check out the stuff I've got going on Patreon. I have uh, two chapters of my History of the World up there and a lot of cool maps. And if you're interested, I made a live stream yesterday, in which I talk about all sorts of questions about history, philosophy, religion, my life. So check that out, and as always, thank you very much, and have a great day.